Hi there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name's Matt Wakeling and this is the show I produce in Sydney, Australia, where I speak to leading guitarists and guitar figures from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me for episode number one of 49, the first show of 2021, and I'm speaking to the amazing Australian guitarist, Martin Chilia. Martin's had an amazing career playing guitar with the legendary Australian surf band, The Atlantics, the wonderfully loved rock pop band Mental As Anything, uh, a slew of solo albums under his own name, uh, many other projects. In fact, I must thank our good friend Joe Matera for hooking me up with Martin, for getting me in touch, and uh, we talk about a collaboration those guys did as well. Martin also happens to have probably the most extraordinary collection of vintage guitars in Australia and we really get into the weeds on that. It's a lot of fun talking about that collection including a 54 Strat amongst other almost priceless museum pieces. Now today's episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, a fantastic online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott, another good friend of our podcast here. Now, Joe was the head of guitar at the uh, amazing GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology in LA, and also the McNally Smith Music School in recent times. And he's poured all that knowledge into the fretboard biology course. Let's hear some words from Joe now. You're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player. Fretboard biology is your answer. Fretboard biology is a self-paced college level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you wanna make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free seven day trial at fretboardbiology.com. Now, if you've been following the show for a while, you'll know that I was one of the beta testers for Fretboard Biology, and I can recommend it as a fantastically paced and organized guitar course. There'll be links in our show notes for you to check that out. Martin Chilia, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. Thanks for coming. I'm very excited to be speaking with you. I've, I've been a fan for a long time, um, so there's so much stuff I want to ask you. Um, a, a real immediate thing I've noticed you've been up to is working with uh, a friend of the podcast, Joe Matera, on on an instrumental track. How, how did that come about? That's, that's good. Well, we, did, we actually did two songs. We released two singles on one day. Um, uh, yeah, okay, Joe approached me a couple of times about some different things. First of all, we were going to do a couple of gigs together. Then with the lockdown and the COVID situation, it ended up being just a, little, a recording project. So we, we did one song, that came out well, and we did a second one. And uh, we sort of co-wrote and, um, and played on them. And, uh, yeah, people, people are liking it. It's a couple of good up-vibe songs. Yeah. One's called, yeah, one's called Sunday Isle, and the other one's called, uh, when I think of it, St Kilda Bay. Yes, that's, that's the track I've heard. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of fun. Yeah. How, how does it work? Uh, Joe's obviously in, in Melbourne, um, and you're up here in Sydney. How, how does the uh, over-the-net composition process yeah, well, work? The wonders of technology. Basically, we were just emailing files back and forward. And I have a studio in Sydney, so I went to the studio and put the track down and got uh, – we had Jacob Cook play drums on it. Yeah, wonderful. And, uh, ju- yeah, it came out yeah, – live drums and just made it all different. You know, just, it just sounds, sounds great. So Jacob came in and did that, and then we uh, mixed it and uh, we're done. It was, it was pretty simple. Jacob would just uh, send his pass across via uh, email. Excellent, excellent. Oh, great result. Well done. Uh, yeah, it came out well. I mean, it was it – was Pretty efficient way of doing it, really. Wonderful, wonderful. So that that new, um, so that release with Joe, I guess that's the first uh, recording release you've had since your your album Shadow Man from from twenty nineteen. Yeah, I think it is actually. That's the first, yeah, the first new recording I've done. Very I've been re- been recording and back, you know, cataloging songs, just having a back catalogue, but I haven't released anything. Okay, at yeah. all. Now Shadow Man, that was your, I believe, your seventh solo album. And the um, before we talk about the album itself, the the title or the the, the title of the album Shadow Man seems to be yeah. uh, a bit of an obvious reference to one of your heroes, Hank Marvin. 
Yeah, it was actually the record company's idea. David Benier, who runs the Bombora label out of Adelaide, it's actually his idea. Okay, okay. And I thought, great, yeah, why? It's so, it's so obvious that I didn't see it. So he suggested it and we went with it. And, uh, and it, yeah, so we, we just put, a, I think, 16 tracks on there that, that go together to make up that album. Uh, half were actually covers and half were original songs. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't do that many covers, but sometimes I just you know like to play songs that I like and sure. do versions of them. sure. So we did that album and uh, it came out. Yeah, that's still ticking over, still doing well. Wonderful. Yeah, it is. A, it is a great mix of your your own tunes and covers, as as you say. Tell me about your your relationship with Hank, because you you grew up in England, where obviously the shadows were were massive for the first. I think was it the first ten years of your life? Yeah, well, in England, yeah, I, I think we, we immigrated to Australia in 1968. Mm-hmm. So I was. Just turned nine then. Okay. In yeah. England, in England, uh, the shadows, well, particularly Hank Marvin, he he was probably as famous as the Queen of England at the wow. time in England. Wow. He was incredibly, you know, a, a character a, as well as a musician. He was just so, you know, well known. He probably couldn't walk down the street, I, I would imagine. Anyway, my dad was a, a huge fan of the shadows, and uh, that's how I got to hear it. And, we came to Australia in person and I got a guitar and just tried to, trying to pick out the tunes. And it went from there. Um, I had good good family support, so that really helped. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and now with Hank, I've met Hank a number of times now. And um, actually last time was in Perth. Uh, Is in that where he's 20... living these days? Yeah, he's been there since 1987. Wow, there you go. Yeah, he moved to Perth. It was just a better life for his kids and a better place to bring up children and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it kept him to like. And, and also, you can be on a plane from Perth to London just, you know, over overnight, basically. Right, right. Still, still 20 hour flight. But it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you can, you can be there the next day, sort of thing. So, sure. Um, so it was still quite accessible to get to England. Yeah. Well, you know, but uh, yeah, so, so Hank actually came to a gig I was playing at in Perth last year. And, uh, that was it. That was a bit of a surprise to you know to walk on stage and Hank Hank Marvin sitting in front of you, like literally, <laughs> literally, you know, less than ten feet away. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's good, but, but I have met him a number of times before, so that was that was sort of fine. And yeah, and then um, yeah, we had a chat for about an hour after the show, and uh, he's always good to talk to. Always, I always learn something. Yeah. You know? Wonderful. And he's he's found a new lease in his playing, hasn't he? He's doing the uh, the whole gypsy. Gypsy jazz kind of thing. Yes, he definitely is, and he's doing it really well. He's got a great angle on it, um, and he plays the stuff. He just plays anything well. Whenever Hank plays the guitar or a melody, it just, it just sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, he's got the touch and the sound and the, the sensibility to you know put a good melody across. Yeah, so he's that's basically his hobby now. He calls it his hobby. Uh huh. That's a pretty good hobby. <laughs> yeah, but he still does it professionally. If you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm. So, so I've learned a lot just talking to him about, you know, arrangements and, oh, we chatted about so much stuff. And, uh, yeah, always something to learn. That's so cool. So when you were learning, when you, when you picked up the guitar in Perth as a, as a young fella, um, I think I've read you, you were just working things out by ear. What, what kind of pieces were, were the initial inspirations? Well, at the time, the big songs were, or the big bands, you had the, the Shadows, which was the first one, the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stones a little bit, uh, but then bands like Creedence Clearwater Revival came out, and so you know I'd sit, sit down and try and work out their songs and, and just yeah you know, just drumming on, getting chords and a few melody lines, and bit by bit uh, you'd pick up stuff. And then I had a friend who had a, a piano in their house, and then the piano stool you lifted the lid up, there was music books. So I used to sit there and try and figure out the notes and try and play the melodies in these music books. Just to figure it out, you know, old show tunes and stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, I'll do a bar here, a bar there, but you pick up stuff by doing that. And that, that's kind of how I did it. And what one day I realized that I could actually work out the chords to songs by, yeah, you know, on the radio or on records by playing along. And I pick out the, I eventually get the chords after two or three times. So once I figured that out, I went through every record in the house and tried to play along with it. <laughs> that's you know? so good. That's so good. Yeah, and you gradually pick up some things, and some things are wrong, probably. And but you just keep, just keep doing it. And it's it's part of the fun. Yeah, definitely. Isn't that an amazing thing for your confidence as well? When you realise, hang on, I can work out this song I've 
loved for yeah you know and then sometimes you know. sometimes you do it wrong and you know, a couple of years later you go ah oh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah or you think you've got it wrong but you've got it right that's even worse <laughs> um <laughs> you know it's, yeah but you used to trial and error and you know and then i basically learned to play um by playing in bands because we at school we had a few friends we used to play together and and stuff and i basically just learned by playing actually playing with other musicians that's how I learned. Okay, on the stage and getting it done. Mm. Yeah, like you go home and it's very gradual. Uh, I'm not a good practicer. I don't sit at home and play guitar all day or anything. I'm not particularly good at that. But, you know, if I've got to write for an album or something, I'll write the songs and play on them. Yep, um, sure. That, that gives me a purpose. But, but with the old days, I used to just, you know, have, I've got band rehearsal tomorrow. Okay, we'll learn this song. So I just go and learn that song. Then I turn up the rehearsal and play it and and try and get it better but I basically and I also grew up with good drummers too which really helped okay yeah I, did, I didn't realize it at the time but I was less fortunate enough to play with good drummers yeah so, that's um, such a that's a, a deal maker or breaker in the band isn't mm, it? it it is it, you, you, yeah if your drummer is not so good you sort of the band just doesn't have the impact yeah but so I was quite lucky to play with good drummers I didn't say I didn't realize until later in life that, oh yeah, I was quite fortunate there yeah, very cool. When mm. when I'm listening to Shadow Man, um, yeah, obviously there's the like you said the covers and and the originals. How do you know where to draw the line between um, authentically? I, I guess talking about the covers to start with. Um, yes. Authentically producing a classic piece of music, and then where to to push the edges of things. For example, um, Apache sounds like a fairly mm-hmm. um, uh, honourable version of of Hank's version is you know you want to reflect all the nuances, but yes. you get to Eleanor Rigby, and you take um, a lot of liberties. Um, at the same time, uh, what I really dug about Eleanor Rigby is that you've got this epic intro. It's a whole new passage you've added, and then yeah. I'm hearing echoes of the the string quartet arrangement that you've rearranged for guitars elsewhere in the song, and obviously, I guess the vocal mm. melody as, as well. So. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, this is a very long question. It's probably a simple question, though. Mm-hmm. So in your arranging, how do you know where to um, yeah, draw that line? Okay, what I do is, say with Apache, because that's a simple one to start with, yep. I learn I learned basically the original version. I learn the song properly. I learn the chords, the melody, the harmony. I learn the song. Once I've learned the song, uh, with Apache, again, I just did a basically what I call an Australian pub rock version. Uh-huh. Uh, because growing up here, people play different in Australia in the 70s and 80s, and probably into the 90s. People play different. Bands play different to they do to anywhere else in the world. Yeah, how do and you? I think how do you measure that? Well, it's just you, when you play to an Australian audience, you, you have like you know, remember the beer barns they ha- you have here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and those places, you have to, you have to, you know, you can't have, uh, you can't be too subtle. You've got to play quite hard and you've yeah, got to project yeah. and you've got to reach your audience, you've got to keep the audience interested. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't happen all over the world quite like that. You might have smaller clubs or like in New York or whatever, but in Australia, I think you have to play like that. All those bands like ACDC, Angels, Rose Tattoo, all those bands come out of that and that's why they play like they do because um, you have to play to that audience. And I think with what I do, every song I take, especially if I do a cover, I'll try and add that to it. Okay. I take the attitude as if I was playing, you know, uh, one of the happening gigs in the eighties or something. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what it is. I didn't realise at the time when I was doing it, but looking back, that seems to be what it reflects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a, I think it's a. I think it's an Australian thing. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. That's a good, a good edge to put on things. Um, we'll talk yeah. about the Atlantics shortly, um, and uh, that'll be an interesting uh, angle as as well. The. Um, mm-hmm. What else? So Eleanor Rigby. So you you were like I said, you're drawing on some of the string lines. Um, what, what what's something then? What's an approach you would give to a tune like that when you really want to uh, put your own stamp on it a little harder? Well, you, you take a melody. Saying you learn the melody first, then you work out what what the song has in it, uh, harmony harmony wise. But I also I took a version of that version of something else. I'm not sure if you aware of a band called Zoot that was around 1970. I know the name. I didn't know they ever covered Eleanor Rigby, though. Wow. Yeah, I taught the chord progression of that, and then oh, I wrote a melody okay. over it. Because I always thought 
when I grew up, I always thought that song wasn't finished, their version. I thought, that's not finished. I'm going to finish it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how that started off as a fun project. And a couple of my, my mates came around, we you know, played drums and bass on it. And, um, and that's what we ended up with. But it's, um, it, you know, it's got tempo changes um, and, and that sort of stuff in there, which no one does anymore in music. It's always the same tempo start to finish. Yeah. Yep. That version's got tempo changes. It's got maybe three or four different tempo changes in it, which is just done naturally when you play the song. We just played it like live. So, um, but that—that's where I got the idea for the chord progression. Okay, so awesome. That's that's where. I, yeah, so I I borrowed that from my youth. One of the first things I heard on the TV was the Zoot playing Ellen Rigby, and that's where I got that from. Nice. And created a, and, and just created a melody over it, and took the vocal parts onto guitar. Yep, wonderful, wonderful. Mm. You've um you've you've appeared in two very much loved Australian bands, the Atlantics and Mental as Anything, as as a key member of both of those bands. Um, yes. Let's start chronologically. The Atlantics. How how did that gig come about for you? Well, with the Atlantics, that happened in the mid to late nineties. Mm-hmm. I was playing in bands. I, I had a residency at the Marble Bar at the Hilton Hotel. Oh, in yeah, Sydney, yeah. We did a couple of nights, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, I think, for a while. Great. And at the time, dance music, techno, techno music was really big. Guitar was a bit uncool. And I just thought, way well, music's going, there's nothing, no records I want to buy. There's nothing coming out that I want to hear. So I thought, I'm just going to start. I'm basically going to make my own album for my own enjoyment. So just, just for, as a hobby, I started writing these songs. Yep. And I had enough songs for an album. I thought, well, it's just pretty good. That'll sound like an album. Like, I wanted to do something like The Shadows or The Beatles would have done in their heydays so anyway i came across um well actually bosco bosna the bass player in the atlantics original bass player i sort of knew him a little bit and then i bumped into him one day and i had a cassette in my pocket of some of the demos i've been doing and i said bosco look um i'm just recording some songs i don't know if you'd be into it but i'd really love for you to come and play bass on my recordings i've got the studio booked for you know, a couple of weeks' time. Anyway, here's the cassette. Have a listen if you like it. But, you know, I'd love for you to play. Anyway, about a week later, I get a call from Bosco. And he goes, I don't want to play any recordings. Well, oh, fair enough. <laughs> he goes, okay, fair enough, you know, that's fine. Thanks for calling. He goes, oh, but would you be interested in joining the Atlantics? <laughs> I go, what? Uh, uh, yeah, he goes, there's only one thing. I go, what's that? He goes, we want to play your songs. Oh, wow. Wow. They love the song so much that it had in the style. Um, and it basically went from there. Fantastic. Next thing I knew, we had an, we had an album done. Um, but we didn't really tell, tell anybody. We, no one knew what we were doing. We, also, we didn't release it. And uh, I think within a month, we were on the ABC, a couple of TV shows, and it just took off from there. We had a pretty good run for a couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. I guess um, for listeners who might not be aware of the Atlantics, they were really the premier surf band in Australia and had a massive worldwide hit with Bombora in 1963. So um, for those guys, especially in the early 60s, to crash into that market that was pretty pretty thick already with superstars is, yeah. is wonderful. And then for them to want to play your tunes must have been quite a thrill. Well, interesting thing about that. Yeah, well, it was. I was a bit surprised and I thought, well, what's the catch? I said, nothing. Oh, and, and we want to make you an equal member. Wait. Wow. It was just, they were just so good to me. They were just so, they just put me. The thing is, when we started rehearsing and playing, all of a sudden they go into one of the old songs, one of the old, you know, song, and, and, um, and I just start playing along with them. Because what I would do after rehearsals, we'd rehearse in the daytime. Mm-hmm. At night, I'd go home and try and go through the back catalogue of Atlantics and okay. try and learn one or t- a song or two just to get up to speed on Because they had a huge catalogue. Yeah, I'd just yeah. try, and, try and, you know, go through them and try and learn stuff. Yep. And they just start playing them. They did not know that I, they, they thought I played on the records. Yeah, wow. Like, That's amazing. It was, it was one of those sort of things. And also, it was like, um, it's like you know, having, meeting up with old school pals. It was just like, but we had never met before. You know, so, yeah, so it really worked out well. Next thing I know, we had a few albums done and we would, you know, did a few tours of Australia. We toured with the Beach Boys and Chris Isaac and a few people like that. The Long Way to the Top Tour, we were on that one. That was a great tour. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Great. I think we did a live studio. It's my first live performance with the Atlantic. It was on national TV on the Studio 22 show. 
Oh, okay. I remember that show on the ABC. That was a great show. Yeah. We played with, that was my first time I ever played live with a band. Wow. No pressure? Just national <laughs> television show. Just do it. You know, you, <laughs> you can't think about it. You think about it, you're in trouble. <laughs> how many? Yeah. So how many years were you with them all up? Well, still am. Actually, we're still, still partners. We're still looking at uh, re-releasing. Uh, we've got three songs we found. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are recorded, not released. Oh, okay. And we're talking about, so we're going to re- remix, remaster one of our, uh, the first album that I did with them. Okay. And add, right. the, bon- add the bonus tracks. So that, that'll be for next year. That's the 21st anniversary of that album. Okay. Wow. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So we're still, we're still, still basically together. Just that the band doesn't play live anymore. Okay. Yep. Yep. And all the, all the guys are still around and still. Yeah. Part of things. Um, I was really talking cool. to, talking to Jim, the other guitar player just yesterday. Jim still, I think he's feeling his age now. With his, he said his hands are getting sore. He's having trouble holding his chords down. Okay. Um, but he's, um, yeah, he's still yeah, trying to write songs, you know. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Great to hear. Yeah, really, really loved band. Um, another band we need to talk about are The Mentals now. Um, yes. And we can't mention them without um, speaking of Greedy Smith, who was, you know, so sad to hear of his passing last December. It was quite a shock, but... Um, yes, of course. For you as a band, a bandmate and a friend, um, yeah, terribly, terribly sorry to hear that news. Yeah, it was it definitely wasn't expected. I can tell you, he wasn't expecting it. I can yeah, tell you that yeah. for sure. Okay. Um, he was. We were just playing. Well, Greedy and myself that week, when he had his heart attack that week, we Greedy and myself were going to start recording uh, for a new album, a new original album for Mentals. Yeah. So we were starting to work on that. And this year, just coming up now, we were, this October, we, were, we had a, um, a release scheduled for oh, that okay. album. Wow. So my year was going to, going to be working on that with Greedy. Yeah. And, uh, of course it didn't eventuate and, um, we didn't even get, well, sort of got the first half of the first song down. I think that's as far as we got. Sure. Um, but he certainly wasn't ready to go. He was not ready. He was still, you know, he was still carrying on like, you know, like he was 30 years old. Yeah. With enthusiasm. Right. He was still, he was still enthusiastic, enthusiastic for the music. He still had the energy and the passion. It was such a shame. Yeah, absolutely. It, it took, took us all by surprise. And, you know, you realize how many lives he actually affected. Mm. You know, just people just, you know, he, he reached so many people. Yeah. 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 Wow. What's, um, I know like Martin, Martin Plaza, the other, uh, yes. Original member, he he hasn't been touring for a few years due to some health issues as well. Um, so where does where does that leave the Mentals? Yeah. Is it is it just well Mentals? I don't. Well, Martin Plaza, oh, he wouldn't have been out with us for a couple of years, maybe yeah. two or three years okay. now. Uh, he's he, he came. He, he did retire. Well, went up the road a couple of times, and then he came out again. But when he came out, he's his health wasn't going to stand up for it. Sure. Basically, when you've got he's got a cancer, cancer, and he's going to take medication and uh, oral chemo. But what happens is when you're touring, you can't keep a schedule. Yeah, it's, sure. You know, your plane runs late, or you you know, the gig runs late, or something changes, and it, it puts your body out of whack. And he just wasn't able to cope with that. It wasn't good for him. So basically, greedy had to send him home. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, so he still still sings well. He's just just a natural singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, I can't see I can't see the band going out as everyone knew it again. I, don't, yeah. I can't see I can't see the band playing. Sure. Tell me um tell me some fond memories of, of playing with those guys because you joined in twenty fourteen, I believe. So. Yeah, January January. Yeah, I just came back from Europe with the Atlantic. We did our last tour of Europe. Mm-hmm. I came back and then I went to America with my own band for a, a while and then I uh, came back and uh, there's a message, mentors are looking for you. And so <laughs> <laughs> basically that's cool. what happened. How great. And, uh, and then I went and, and, and started with them. I always thought you were such a good fit because if you look at Reg Mombasa's guitar parts, they were always a bit kooky, but there was a real mm. surf, surfy, psychedelic almost edge to them. Um, that I could see you kind of slotting into and making your own. Yeah, well, for me, it was really natural. I didn't have to try to be anybody else, mm-hmm. you know, to be part of the sound. I think, yeah, Reg is quite quirky and he was quite, you know, he, he was uh, played some really good stuff, interesting stuff. And, it, you know, and his playing had a lot of personality. 
I think. Yeah. So that was a great, that was a great, for me, it was just great. You know, I just walked in and it was like, yeah, this is home. Any particularly it, memorable gigs or, or sessions with those guys? Oh, try, there's probably lots, lots of things. Uh, i trying to think of some. Uh, I need a, something in context to, Sure. Yeah. I, I think I did. Um, management told me that um, when we stopped the band when Greedy passed away, that I, I did 750 shows with the band, wow. according to the manager. Wow. So that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of traveling. But we, we went to we went to China. We went to New Zealand a couple of times, and mm-hmm. who knows how many times around Australia. Yeah. But yeah. I remember I remember one week. I remember doing a gig in Perth on Friday. I did. A, I also play in a band called Dave Warner from the suburbs. Mm-hmm. I remember Dave. And um, we did. I did a gig in Perth with Dave on Friday, a gig in Sydney with Mentors on Saturday, a gig at the festival in Perth on Sunday, <laughs> and then it was Australia. It was a long weekend, and then the Monday I did Dubbo with Mentors. Oh wow! So so it was Perth twice. Yeah, it's Sydney in between, <laughs> then back to Dubbo. I remember that weekend was, like, it was <laughs> a bit of a blur. Um, but we did stuff like that. We did mad stuff like that. For our overseas listeners, we should probably point out the distance between Perth and Sydney is pretty much the width of um, the United States. It's a pretty similar exactly. landmass, which is crazy. Well, wow. It's like you play Houston, then you play, you know, Seattle, then you play yeah. um, Nash- Nashville, then the next <laughs> night, you, yeah. So it's back and forth. So you spent, I spent most of the time on the plane, I think. Yeah, right. Oh, man. Full <laughs> on, full on. But... So that's just one of the weekends. Yeah, that's just one of the things that come to mind as being you know, a bit bizarre. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, as, as I've, I've said a few times, much loved. And you look at that back catalogue and um, the affection for which that band is held in. Um, yeah, it must have been a very special um, season for you. It was great. Well, the thing about Mentals, they had the songs. They had the good songwriters. They had the songs. Yeah. Mentals were a sing- singles band rather than an album band. Yeah, okay. Yep, I can see that. Um yeah, and so when you play a gig, it was about which hit to leave out. Wow. <laughs> you know, not, not, what was, not so much what to put in. That's a good problem, out. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so that, that was an interesting scenario. And uh, it, all, it was also pointed out to me by a journalist that Mentals have had more songs in the Australian Top 40 than any other act, including overseas anyone. Really? Oh, wow, mm. wow. They hold a record. Yeah, some of them might only been like you know number thirty six or something in the charts, sure, but they had sure. more single entries in the Australian singles chart than any other act ever. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. So, um, so when you play a gig, it's it's always thing about Australia. You know, you always have the Friday night fights at pubs and yeah, all that sort of stuff. Mentals never had any of that. There was never any aggro at our gigs. Uh-huh. It was always everyone was always in a good mood. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, it's, it's just a very up up band to be in, up by band to be in, a good fun, yep. professional, um, well-managed, well-organised. It's, it's great. Excellent, excellent. Good to hear. Good to hear. That's really, really cool. Mm. Um, yeah. I actually know Jacob um, Cook, your, your drummer, who, who you mentioned yes. earlier on. Yeah, he's a lovely bloke um, and Isn't fantastic he? Yes. musician. So I was thrilled when he got that gig, um, yeah, about a number of years ago now. So that's cool. Yeah, so Jake plays mostly, uh, does a lot of my solo albums now. Oh, okay, excellent. He's been doing, he did, uh, well, Ellen Rigby, you mentioned before, that's Jacob playing. Oh, cool, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Now, before we started recording, you mentioned to me about the North Melbourne Surf Club. That's a, a new project. Uh, yes, that's, my, that's the latest one. Tell me about band that. Project. Okay, North Melbourne Surf Club is a band we put together over a couple of days in Melbourne. Uh, a year or so ago, we went in the studio on a Monday, I think, and and by Wednesday we had the album done. Wow! Um, we just worked between ten and five in the afternoon. It was an easy day. So cool. Think, and it was a bit of an all star band. Um, there was uh, myself playing guitar, Tony Naylor uh, on guitar. Tony's a great, great player. He's been a lot of uh, well known bands, including uh, Brian Cadd's Bootleg Family, and he's played on a lot of records. Uh, and then there's uh, Jeff Cox on drums, I was known as Coxie. He was, uh, he's played on a lot of hit records as well when I think about it. He, he toured with LRB for a while. Okay. With, with oh, a band. Cool. And James Gillard on bass. James yeah. was um, Mondo Rock. Yes. Probably best known for, for playing on the Chemistry album. Yeah, great. And, uh, great singer as well. 
He's very good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, produced by David Briggs. David was the guitar player in Little River Band. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, all the, you know, the, the, the golden lineup. Yeah. And uh, he also wrote a song called Lonesome Loser, which was, uh, I think, their only ever number one hit in America. Oh, that was his tune. Wow. Yeah, he wrote that. And he also produced the first Australian Crawl album. Okay, great. So anyway, so David engineered and produced uh, this album with us. We did it like this, you know, a couple of easy days. And uh, so we're finally getting it out. It comes out the 15th of October. And it's a bit of an all-star band, but all the songs are fresh. And it's all just it just sounds like a band playing live in a room, which is what it was. Great stuff. Is it like originals, cover tunes? All original tunes. All original tunes. I think I wrote... I think I wrote nine of them. Tony Naylor wrote three, and James Gill and myself wrote one. We okay. actually have Joe Camilleri on sax on one song. He oh, came and played awesome, sax man. on That's one of cool. the songs. So, yeah. So uh, it's, it's a bit of fun. Very good. And it's a great band name too, the North Melbourne Surf Club. Yeah, it's pretty original. And, uh, well, because most of the band was from you know, from Melbourne, and also we recorded there. Yep. We thought that would be a good name, you know. It's, um, and the gag being that there is no North Melbourne That's Beach right. or Surf Club. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, I hope you're enjoying the interview with Martin Chilia. We'll be back with more. We're just about to do a deep dive into his vintage guitar collection, which is unbelievable. (laughs) Stick around for that. But in the meantime, I need to let you know that today's show is brought to you by Fretboard Biology. Get the knowledge without the college, the amazing online guitar program put together by Joe Elliott, the former head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology in LA and also head of guitar at the McNally Smith School. Up until very recently, Joe's poured all that knowledge into this online course. I was a beta tester for it. I loved it as a music educator myself. I'm very happy to endorse the course. And also players like Greg Koch and Brett Garsett have also given ringing endorsement of the program so check it out there's links in our show notes for fretboard biology all right back to our interview uh martin we need to talk guitars um yes <laughs> i don't know where to start actually yeah, i think i do when did you start collecting because you've got uh, quite a collection um but you seem to to twig with vintage guitars much earlier than than the rest of us when did all this start for you well, what happened was I um I got my first Stratocaster in January 1973. I remember because I saved up for it. I was, I was about 13 or something. Wow. And I, I remember saving up for it, doing paper rounds and all that. Mm-hmm. And I still had that guitar. And I remember the date because the receipt's still in the case. Oh, okay. Now, was it a, was it a new guitar or an old one? Yeah, it was brand new. I brand bought it new. brand new. Okay. But I had a friend who knew someone at the warehouse, the CBS warehouse, who imported Fenders, we went down there. We picked out what we thought was the best one. Oh, nice. Down there. Nice. So we had that. I had some guidance earlier on, which was great. And this guitar, I've still got the guitar. It's, it's, um, I just basically worn the frets down. That's all. <laughs> but I played that guitar all the time, you know, yeah. and then, um, I discovered that, oh, sometimes you need a spare guitar. So I bought a, um, I just went out to the shops and I bought like whatever it was around 1976 straight or seven, whatever it was around the time when I bought one thinking it'd be the same. Uh-huh. And it just didn't sound the same. It just wasn't, I, know, I couldn't get it right. So I did that. I did, I bought a cup, two or three things. This is in the uh, you know, late seventies. I just couldn't get it right. So I, um, uh, just sold them. And then I went to England for a year and played over there. And I just only took my the original strat with me. Yeah. And I sort of got to know people over there and got a bit cleared up about the vintage stuff and what were good and what, what, what to look out for, what not to look out for. I had no idea, really. There was no YouTube things. There was no – you couldn't Google anything. You had to learn by experience. So I um, I bought another 72 Strat within a, you know, a, couple, a month or two of the one I already had. Okay. It it. And it was – yeah, that's pretty good. So I worked out that – timelines of when things change and when the sound changed okay okay and i worked out and then went from there and then when i got back to perth a friend of mine had an l series uh, 63 original fiesta rest rat and he then he said i'll play this for one i played that and i went oh oh this is really good yeah. <laughs> that's that's a hank guitar right there 
Yeah. And so, uh, but he still got that guitar. He never wanted to sell it. It's one of the things he's, you know, he'll never sell. So I thought, well, okay, now I've had a taste. My other one, my original one was wearing out. The frets are wearing out. But well, do I get this one refretted? I'll just go. And so I, that's when they introduced the uh, vintage reissues. Okay. Yep. And 82. I went, I bought one of the first ones of those. I thought, this is pretty good. Um, and I hadn't quite got into, I think I might add a couple of 60s Burns guitars by then or, or things like that. Okay. Yep. But, so I bought this reissue because I couldn't find a real one. I couldn't find a real one to buy. So when I say a real one, I mean like an old early 60s yeah, strap. Gotcha. I couldn't find it. So I bought this reissue, which, I, which is a guitar I used for every Mentors gig that I just played, you know, for all those gigs. I used one I used one guitar for the whole time. Oh, really? In the band. Yeah. In the studio, I had a couple of others, but I used one guitar for every gig, everything we did. And, and which one was that? It's a the, the re, uh, reissue. Um, oh, okay. Uh, 1982 Fender, what they call them, um, 62 reissue. Gotcha, gotcha. So that yeah, wow, and I used that off. guitar. I've used that on a lot of records. I've used that so much. Um, I just got lucky. I got a good one. And you know, but, you know even though I got a lot of guitars, I still I just use one guitar for, for that gig. I found the voice, and you just stick with it. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Um, I think I never broke a string once in the last song. Okay. Out of all that time, so you know, I just played the one guitar. Oh wow. Um, so, so, so that's how I got into it. And then what happened was I bought this one and I had to buy it on, um, you know, get a loan and buy it, the, the reissue. Mm-hmm. And then I had, was in a band in Perth, West Australia. We did, were doing quite well. So we were earning some money. So I could, you know, uh, I could afford to I pay my loan out and I did that pretty quickly. And then a, and then another a 1963 Strat came up, a real one. Wow. Wow. So I got some money together and I bought it, which I, and I still have that guitar. It's a candy apple. Okay. Oh um, man, awesome. and it's great. And I still have that guitar. It's um, it, and I bought that, and then I thought, okay, this is really good. Uh, and then I started buying Stratocasters. Um, I must have bought I don't know how many I had at one stage. I had a lot of old Strats, but the problem there was I had so many I wasn't enjoying them. Right. Gotcha. Um, so I sold. I, then I started discovering Gibsons, old Gibsons, like fifties and early sixties Gibson guitars, and I realised that I've seen a lot of Stratocasters, like old Strats, especially between sixty one and sixty five, that, that, those sort of years in Australia. I think I thought, how many old Gibsons have I seen? Good ones. I thought, hardly any. I've never seen an original Les Paul, like a fifties Les Paul, mm-hmm. at that stage. And then I started learning about Gibsons, and basically. I sold a, a lot of the straps to buy the Gibsons. Okay, okay. <laughs> mm. So I've never regretted it, but, but I had too many Stratocasters that I wasn't <laughs> in, you know, able to enjoy them. But now I've got, I'm, I don't know how many I have now, I've still got quite a few, but at least I know what they all are. Yeah, okay, um, okay. So how many, um, so you've mentioned your reissue being a really special one. That's 63, sounds yeah. like it's a really special yeah. Strat. Um Obviously, your your original seventy three. Did have you like done any mods or anything on any of those guitars? Uh, the only one that I did change the pickups on was the reissue because I was playing it in nineteen eighty five or eighty four, somewhere around there. I only had it for a while when we were playing with sweaty pub gigs, and basically the, one of the pickups just corroded out. Okay, yep. And I had a gig the next night, so I just went and bought a friend of mine said try these out. And it was a set of EMG pickups. Mm-hmm, yep. I said, oh, I don't know about that. Well, anyway, I put them in. I haven't taken them out since. Wow, very cool. Isn't that interesting? They've, they've got mm. a reputation, even even back in the day, but the tones you would pull with them are super organic. Or, I mean, even Ian Moss, he was he was playing EMGs yeah. for a lot of that chisel stuff, and it just sounds like yes. a strat, you know? It sounds it, it does. It, wonderful. It just, yeah, and I've not taken those pickups out at all. It's, um, I thought I'd put them in there, get my other pickup rewound, put them back, but I okay. haven't. Wow. They've, they've never have these ones work work great and especially when you're touring you've got to use higher amps as well yeah okay you know, yep. they can be quieter and they just have a better fuller sound sure I just found it better mm. yeah you started mentioning the Gibsons what what are some of your favourite Gibson guitars in your collection um it's, it's a strange thing my Gibson collection I've got a couple of 50s let's pull gold tops now, I never even liked gold tops when I was growing up. I never even watched them. Oh, what are they? They look, they look, they look, probably because I saw the Ibanez ones first. I'm okay. not sure. 
So I've got a 54 gold top that looks like it's about, you know, six weeks old. Wow. Um, no way. Is that and like, it sounds fantastic. It, the yeah, and I've got 90 the, the uh, yeah. one-piece bridge, tailpiece thing? Yep, that's the one. But this one would be the best in the country. I've had it for quite a while, but it's yeah. it, at the time it cost me, I mean, it cost me a lot. Uh, it cost me, a, a, I had a, a 1962 Fiesta Red Strat uh, in 9 out of 10 condition with original hand ta- hang tags. Oh, man. Uh, and that's what it cost me to get that list, Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I just sort of thought, how many of these straps, how many straps have I seen? Oh, I've seen a few old ones. How many Les Pauls have I seen? None. None. Yeah, so you jumped on. Uh, so I bought that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a great, it's just a great sounding guitar. You know, it just sounds great. And I've got a 1958 gold top as well with the pass, the, you know, the, uh, the humbucking pickups. That looks like it's about six months old. Wow. So what year? 50, just, 50 what? 58. 58. Oh, man. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's um, when the PAFs were. Yeah. Yeah, that era. And I mean, obviously the 59s are the, like the unicorn of the, the Les Paul world. But man, the 58, how awesome. Well, I had a 59. Uh, and the, the, this, this guitar sounded better, so I kept this one. Okay, okay. I compared, yeah, this one just, just sounded better. Yep. Uh, it's an early 1960, whatever it was, and it was this one just sounded better. Yeah. So I kept this one. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> I've got to go with that's what I, you know, if you're going to go collecting and, and horse trading, it's different, but when I do it, I like the sound of them. Yeah. I did that. So, yeah, and I think probably my best sounding Gibson guitar is the, um, I've got a cherry red 1964 335, a bit like the Clapton one, okay. the same as Eric yeah, Clapton one. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's full Clapton era. Um, that's possibly the best sounding guitar. Okay. Um, it's amazing. Just, yeah. Some some days I play and I go, oh, I don't like it today, but generally it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's good. It's just one of the best ones. You can use it for anything. It just sounds great. Fantastic. Man. Yeah. Have you got any, um, are there any guitars you're still looking for? You've, you've, are there any uh, like missing pieces that, that you're still hunting for? Well, there's a couple of things. Yeah, I guess so. But, you know, all in all, I don't know what else I need, you know. Yeah, you're it's, sure. Uh, I, I just sort of think what I need. I, I tend to use the same handful of guitars all the time. I've yeah. got this 1961 uh, Strat, Stratocaster. I've had that since the 80s. I use that pretty well. That's sort of the first call Strat. If I've got to do a Strat recording, or that's a guitar that comes out. Okay. It just sounds incredible it just yeah. records well i've used it on virtually everything i've done that all the atlantic stuff solo stuff oh, okay it's pretty well the yeah. guitar yeah yeah nice i was going to ask you what, what you take out on the road because you've got these you know precious vintage guitars i mean i think you've probably already answered with the that reissue being your main mentals guitar well, that or was, anything what else yeah, would you well, take out in, well that reissue that's been in the back of many trucks they were row cased yeah, I want to take them out, so they're still pretty well protected. You're trying to get, hopefully, got good people looking after them. Yeah. Um, the white, the '61 Strat, I've taken that around the world. Okay. Um, yeah, that's been that's been with me a lot of places. Uh, pretty well, I take that. Uh, well, it depends what gig I've got. I've got this other guitar I take out if I've got a rock gig. I've got a 1959 Les Paul Custom, uh, the Ebony one, but it's the rare two pickup model. The two path pickups. Oh, okay. Because they usually, yeah, the three, the three, three yeah. Humbuckers. I've got one of the, yeah, and it's a very early fifty nine. Okay. Uh, I can't remember what the serial number is, but I remember it's quite an early serial number, and I use that for basically everything else. It's um, uh, yeah. It, it, I just have it in a normal case. No one knows what's in there. Yeah. And they just think everyone just thinks it's just you know another Liz Paul, but I use that a heck of a lot. I've done probably thousand or so gigs on that one, if not more. Okay. Yep. Um, so that's a guitar I'll take out. You know, you've got to sometimes t- pick one to, t- to take out and use. And I had that refretted. I've got the bigger frets put in probably about 20 years ago. I had that refretted. Yeah. Pierce Crocker did a great job on that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. He did that. And um, I've also got a 1954 Strat, one of the first ones ever made. Wow. Tell me, it was on the cover of, tell me about that one. Like, it was on the cover of the... Um, Australian Guitar Magazine, one of the Fender Anniversary issues, probably going on quite a few years oh, ago now. I think I remember it. I think yeah. it was the 50th anniversary, maybe. I remember that article, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. They borrowed the guitar off me for that. Okay. It's it's That's a, one of the best sounding Stratocasters I've ever heard. Um, it's pre-production. It's got a pencil date on the body and on the neck that says uh, May 
1954. Wow. Because was it it October, the official or the – I know the date's a little sketchy, but May's – that's early, yeah. Yeah, I know it's a couple of uh, months before the day of Gilmore, number one, was made. Okay. Um, But, yeah, it's just a great guitar. I bought it because it just sounded so good. And uh, And how did you find that? I got a phone call one day and someone said, my mate rang up and said, you need to get here now. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you need to see this. Uh, this guy had it. He bought it in Nashville in 1970. Okay. And he basically, basically had it under his bed until when I got it. Okay. He just, it's a guy who just decided he wants to sell it. You, but my mate said, you've got, to, you've got to come here. So I managed to do it, you know, negotiate that one. And um, I just said, basically, to him, what's it going to take for me to get this? You know? Mm-hmm. And and then way then when when I sorted it out, but yeah, that's a really rare one. Um, but it just, it just sounded so good. I just played one chord and went, yeah, wow. And I had that again. Pierce Crocker refretted that mm-hmm. probably about twenty years ago. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I just had to make them playable. This is just... this is what I love. You've got these unbelievable guitars, but you you're not afraid to refret them and and take them out and play them. And I think that's what uh, Leo Fender intended. I think so. The thing about a Stratocaster, uh, that's so, or a Telecaster for that matter, that's so strong. <laughs> you know, you, yeah, you try yeah. and break one. I'm not. A, I would try, but they're, sure. they're made to be played. Some of the Gibsons can be a bit fragile. Um, interesting story here. I've got a, a, a Gibson Super 400, uh, same as Scotty Moore. Okay. You know the Elvis Presley yes. comeback special, 68, the one that's on that. That's the Elvis plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a 1960, same as that. Mine's late December 1960, I think was the day on it. Okay. And um, it's, you know, all original, uh, one owner before I got it. And uh, th- uh, that was just used in that um, Elvis movie. They're making a, an Elvis movie up in the Gold Coast. Oh, is it the Tom Hanks thing? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, went, I was up on the Gold I went up there, t- I took the guitar up for the movie. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> cool. That was a thing. That was in February, I think. I think I just got back just before the curfew. Okay. Okay. Yep. You know, the, before they close the borders, I just yes. said to the production people, "I need to get out of here now." Wow. <laughs> you know? And is it still up there? Uh, no, no. I've got the guitar with oh, me now. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that I don't know whether they go, they've done the scenes or what, I don't know what they did with it or what. I didn't see everything. Okay. Um, or whether they're going to want it back again. But it's the uh, only one they could find. Because I was hesitant to let it out because, you know, it's just a work of art. Yes. Oh, beautiful And it's such a, such a good – it's a great guitar. So um, and you don't want to get one of those, you know, knocked over or damaged. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, I'll try and help them find another. But we couldn't. Couldn't find one like it. So anyway, so I've got that guitar. So it's, and that's a great sounding guitar. It just sounds great and mm-hmm. plays great. And, um, and the workmanship on it is incredible. Wow. That's very cool. Mm. Excellent. So things like that, I really enjoy them. They're just like works of art, and you've got to, you know, plus, plus you can play them. Yep, yep, yep. So that's a, that's a, that's a good guitar. That's a very good guitar. Um, there's probably a few other things. I've, I've got a Gibson uh, with a, a six-digit serial number of zeros. It's all zeros, zero, 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 okay. zero, zero. Wow. And what, um, what, what type of Gibson? That's a Gibson SG Junior from 1967, all oh, the specs of 67. Okay. And if you look at the Gibson ledgers, it goes to nine 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 nine, yeah, and then it goes to five zeros and a one. There's no zero zero zero. It's not ah. on the ledgers, but that's exactly when that guitar would have been made. Okay, and you've got six zeros. Yeah, six zeros. And it's, it's it's real. It's um yeah. Wow, and that would From have been when when was well, the six... when was the SG called the Les Paul? Was that sixty? Five ish, or well, late sixty, no, late sixty one to uh, up until maybe late sixty two. Oh, okay, okay. I'm so this is just an SG. It's just a white junior, and it sounds. I've used that at gigs. It sounds incredible. Great rock guitar. Uh-huh. It's got a great pickup. And it just sounds really good. Wow. That's just a little fun fact there that that it's got one of that serial number which doesn't exist. Yeah. Oh man. Oh. Very cool. <laughs> so I don't know how that got it. That could be a, a worker's guitar. Maybe someone snuck it out or something. Yeah. Okay. I'm but, yeah. I'm knocked out. Like whenever I talk about vintage gear, I'm, I'm knocked out by how much epic stuff was made. Say by '59, you had everything. You had the Telly, the Strat, the Les yeah. Paul. You had the the semi hollows. That you know the three three fives by then. Even the um, even the Explorer and the V, which didn't uh, 
you know, it took another couple of decades to, to make a dent, I guess. But all yeah. these classic guitars and you think that's just Fender and Gibson, of course. Um, yes. Um, and has anything really radically changed or improved since then? I mean, there's there, there's little moves mm. forward, you know, in, in performance, I guess, in, in, in some aspects. But the actual designs just nailed it in that first, you know, 10 years of production. I think so. I mean, music changes with technology as well. So um, when Eddie Van Halen came along, you know, that was an interesting era because um, the way he put the Gibson sound into a Stratocaster guitar mm-hmm. is kind of yeah. what he made. He, he kind of just, it's a very simple simple idea what he did, but it just really now, he got the right pickup, good sounding clear pickup, and it, he put that into a Fender guitar and it worked. That was a real big change for everybody I think, i'm sure other people were doing it as well but mm-hmm. uh, he was a big one sure but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it is interesting because yeah you can't beat the sound of an original late 50s early 60s gibson or, or especially gibson that's their golden golden period sure, and then fenders yeah. anything you know i've never heard anything sound better than the real ones or what i call the real ones yeah yeah um but basically with gibson 1965 would probably be the first cutoff point for that then okay. things change a bit fenders um fenders can go into like 1965 you can still find good ones depending on the model if it's a base anything up to 1968 they still sound the same as the early 60s ones okay yep they, they what we call the transitional models when they're still using some of the yeah yeah the, it must be because i can't parts. tell the difference between the sounds of them yeah okay. uh, and it's when they when they must run maybe the bases they had more parts or something left over but the bases i, I can't tell the difference from sound between a 67 and a 63 or something. Okay. Not yeah. the ones I play. They, they all sound very similar. Yeah, cool. Mm. But with strats that you can, you can tell the difference between a 63 strat and a 67 strat. Right. For example. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I think by 67, mm. CBS had well and truly kicked in. and. Oh, yeah, yeah. Things have changed. Yeah. But yeah, with bases, I, don't, uh, I think the bases had to have a longer life. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. a little fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> So fascinating, all this stuff. Hey, Martin, I've got to ask you before we wrap up, what's what's the yes. secret to authentic surf guitar tone? Because if anyone in Australia knows, it's you. Well, the thing is with authentic, it depends what you call authentic. Uh, most people think America, California, 1962, 63. I think if you want to go for the classic thing, it's when the reverb, Tender Reverb Tank came out, which is early 60s. Uh-huh. So really it should be a Fender guitar, Fender reverb tank and a Fender amp. Right. That's really what I would have thought. People debate between jazz masters and Jaguars and Strats. Right. Which is the best sounding. I think, well, I did an album called Revenge of the Surf Guitar, which was my first solo album. I actually used a, uh, a Jaguar on that album. Oh, okay. Through a Fender amp. Yeah. Which I'm always a Strat through a Vox amp. That's what I've always done. Yeah. I wanted to sound different to the Atlantic. I thought, well, I'm doing a solo, I'm going to sound a bit different. So I did that. And I just used a, rever- a Fender reverb tank into a, a Viva Verb, a 210-inch Viva Verb, okay. and then a, a, an L-series um, was it Jaguar. And it was really hard to play because the short scale, yes. you, couldn't do, you, you couldn't really wow out on it. You couldn't do any – had no sustain. Right. You couldn't, you couldn't play up the neck and bend notes, and it just wasn't going to do it. So I uh, that, that restricted me to play a certain way, which I thought made me sound younger, which I thought was a good thing. Mm-hmm. But if I do that, it's going to make me sound younger. So that's kind of what I did. <laughs> and um, that album still sells. It does well. So uh, hopefully that was okay, you know. But um, So I'd say authentic, yeah, Fender guitar, Fender, uh, a clean Fender amp, and uh, maybe a, a Fender reverb tank. Gotcha, yeah. Do you... Um... Um, do you subscribe to the Dick Dale idea of having you know gigantic strings? What what, what do you use? Um, it varies. Uh, I use gauge eleven to forty nine, I think. Okay, Daddario. Yep. Um, I've been using those for years. Generally, I use those. Uh, occasionally, I'll go down to ten to forty six. I want a lighter sound. Or on my, uh, I've got I've got an L series strat set with flat wound strings as well. Oh, okay. I can't remember yep. the gauges, and they're a bit heavier uh, right. on there. I've got some I've got some jazz guitars where I have. Heavier gauge flat wound strings, but sure. the strat with the flat wound, it's sometimes I, you play a melody or you're playing a song and it just sounds a little bit rattly or a little bit thin. Okay. I, I'll get the strat with the flat wounds and it just sits nicely in the mix. Ah, nice. So I use that, I use that occasionally. Um, also, the flat wound strings last for years. 
Um, I tend to change the top two strings every couple of years. That's right, yes. <laughs> so, um, but that one's just basically it's just the studio. That's a great sounding L series, that, that one. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just solid and you put the heavy strings on it, it loves it. But yeah, string wise, I just found 11 to 49 would do everything. Okay. You know, they would do everything. They'd have, they'd have good output, good sound. Um, you could play in tune better than the lighter strings. Um, yeah. And what about yeah, on, all, on the yeah. Gibsons? Because, uh, yeah, again, a shorter scale, the tension's a little different. Do you stick with the 11s? Or? Um, well, interesting, they're one of the less cool custom, which they had refretted with, um, yeah, not a fretless wonder anymore, it's got frets in it. Yeah, I've nice. got 11s, 49s on that. Okay. But on my um, 54 gold top, I think I've got, I've got 10 gauge on that. Okay. 10 to 46, I think, on the other Gibsons. But mostly, almost 335, there's 11s. I was trying to remember. It depends on what I want to do with it. Sure. Um, each guitar is different too. Each guitar it depends on how high the frets are and, and the shape of the fingerboard and stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, sometimes if I want a light rhythm sound, I'll use 10 gauge. I actually even re- uh, put, a, put nines on a guitar recently because I wanted to get a, a funky sound. I was finding I was just getting a bit heavy-handed otherwise. Okay, yeah. But putting nines on was weird. I think I broke <laughs> one putting it on. I think I broke one putting it on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it depends, it depends what sound you want. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, and then there's um, then there's the acoustic guitars, which is another thing again. You know, um, playing live, you might want you might want heavier strings to get more volume, but when you record, if the bass strings are too heavy, you'll get too much boom. Right. Yeah. It's, so it's a fine line there as well. Yeah, sure, sure. But yeah, that's but, that's interesting though. Yeah, because I think Dick Dale was. I don't, I can't even remember the gauges. I just remember it was crazy thick through. Um, I, I, actually, I've got a Dick Dale story for you. Uh, I was over in America in 2011. Yeah, I was playing at Huntington Beach. Is playing a little at a, a, a tiki bar there, and um, these people come up to me and they said, um, "What are you doing tomorrow?" And I said, "Oh, well, I'm going to head off. Like I was going up the coast or something." They go. Well, Dick, Dick Dow wants to meet you. So I said, well, if Dick Dow wants to meet you, I'm, I'm wherever he is. <laughs> so they said, um, they said um, they've got the hotel number, you know, where, where I was staying, the uh, hotel there, and, and and they said, we'll ring you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I went, oh, yeah, you know, it could be a few drinks talking here. Next morning, quarter to 10, the phone rings. We'll wow. be there in 10 minutes to pick you up. We're, we're going out to his ranch. He wants to meet you. <laughs> So next thing, driving out towards me, I go past Joshua's tree to, you know, the, the, the de- basically the desert. I thought, geez, I've been kidnapped. What's going on? <laughs> anyway, short, short story, we get there. I meet him and you know, we, we hit it off really well. So I'm sitting in his lounge room and we're just, and he's telling me about all this sort of stuff. And we're talking about, you know, the guitars and, you know, and then halfway through a conversation, he just, he just turns to me and goes, what size shoes do you take? I went, what? He goes, what size shoes do you take? I went, oh, I don't know, because I'm thinking Australian sizes are different to American sizes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with Dick Dow, you, you don't get hesitant. You just got to say yes or no. Da, 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 da. And I went, oh, whatever I said, I'll come out eight. And he goes, hmm. He t- takes his shoes off and put, he says, put these on. So I'm walking around his lounge room wearing his shoes. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just going, I've got to wake up in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> And what was the? Was, did he give you the shoes or what was? Oh, kind of. He said, "Those be really." He said, "We're talking about posture and stuff." He said, "Oh, these are really good. This is what I like to play in when I'm playing." We okay. talked about that stuff. And yeah, yeah he, he started talking about that. He said, "Put these on." How they, so I'm walking around his lounge room wearing his shoes. I'm going, "This is, you know, it's a bit, a bit surreal." Anyway, so we, <laughs> we, we're talking about all that sort of stuff. You know, the posture and the how you get the power out of the notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, he plays quite hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also, I don't know if you probably know, he strings his guitar uh, so that the strings reverse. So he's got a left-handed yeah, guitar, but it yeah. also looks like it, you can play it right-handed. Mm-hmm. And so his top strings, you know, his low string, instead of being on, on top, it's down the bottom. So he gets a different angle than when he hits the string. His wrist is turned slightly different. Yeah, right. But he's, yeah. um, he's and we were talking, he explained to me the beats that he uses, the rhythms. So it's a real education. And... Um, uh, yeah, so I, I just remember that time. So with with strings, he had they were pretty pretty serious. I mean, they were pretty solid. Uh-huh. And when I joined the Atlantics, Jim Skithitis, a guy who played you know Bombora and that, he had on his strap thirteen to something. I can't that was so heavy. That's what he was using up, <laughs> up until you know, uh, you know, twenty years ago. 
goodness. Chunky. On a Strat that, oh, you play the thing, you knew you played it, it had lots of volume and, and the notes, every note was crystal clear. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because like, I did write the gauges down, worked them out and wrote them down one time, but they were like 13 and they, they got quite heavy. Um, Stick down might have been a 60 on the E string. I can't remember. Wow. But it was pretty, you know, you, you knew when you were hitting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it had resonance. So it's interesting. That's how they do it. That also, that's how they learn. They didn't know any different. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, he didn't know. You can go for the easy way out or the way. He didn't know any different. He was just, that's how he was used to playing and that's all he ever knew. And that's how he built his style around. Yeah. He's worked with the instrument that way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it worked. And, uh, I noticed he didn't have a tremolo arm in there. He had the, you know, the vibrato arm that goes in the block there. He didn't have one on his guitar. He had his out. He didn't know where it was when I asked him. Oh, okay. He, yeah, so I, think, I think he said, oh, it's got, that went years ago, you know. Oh, really? Wow. Because that's a, like for a lot of players, including yourself, you know, it's a, it's mm. a big deal, the Strat um, trem system. That's, that sounds pretty surfy to me as well. I use that a lot. When I play a Strat, I use a lot. I don't miss it when I don't play the Strat. It's one of those things. Okay. Well, Eleanor Rigby, for example, that Eleanor Rigby song that we mentioned before, that's yeah. um, that, that's less cool custom. Okay. On okay. there, the black, it's the black less cool. Black one, but it yeah. sounds a bit, yeah, but it sounds a bit like a Strat. Um, what I did find was, I, I got an, an original um, fifty-eight basement amp, you know, the Tweed one, the classic, oh, yeah. whatever. Wow. What I did notice was, I bought that years ago, but if I've got, a, say, a fifties uh, Fender or early sixties Fender and a fifties, say, Les Paul. If I just change the lead over on the guitar, I don't have to touch the settings on the amp. The settings are still the same. You don't have to adjust the bass or treble. They just both sound the same setting. It works for both of them. Wow. Wow. That's With remarkable. modern guitars, yeah, modern guitars, you put a telly, you put a Les Paul in, you've got to, you've got to move the amp around, the tones on the amp. But the thing about those guitars is, I noticed with the Les Paul with the past pickups and the Fenders from that era of, say, the mid 50s Telecasters or whatever. You didn't have to change any settings on the amp. Perfect. Wow, really so that was interesting. Another, yeah, that's another thing I learned by accident one day. Because mm-hmm. um, I've got a couple of old tellies, and but I've got a fifty-six that just sounds amazing. Okay, yeah, and that just, yeah, you just don't change. You don't change the settings. It's, it's, so that's yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's an interesting thing there. Yeah, you're saying about Fender kind of got it right by then. Yeah. Well, Gibson got it right. Yeah, the golden golden era, right there. Yeah, yeah, and same with the amps and the guitars. He just Plug them in, they just sound good straight away. Yeah, no mucking around. You don't need anything, you know. It's it's it's, it's pretty good. Martin, have you got time to talk about your own guitar with the, the Alan Enwistle? Um, yes. Well, Alan, uh, a few years ago, Alan actually sent me. I've uh, gone touch with me. He said, "I love your playing. I love to make your guitar." So he sent a guitar. He said, "What would you like?" And I said, "Fiesta Red, matching headstock, three P ninety pickups, um, minimal switching." I uh, just want, you know, basically volume and tone. Sure, yeah. And, um, you know, and the and like a Fender-style vibrato system, tremolo system. And uh, he anyway, he made it, sent it to me. I thought, oh, this is pretty good. And the pickups just sounding great, straight up. So I thought, and then he had a lot of people ask me about it. So we got a batch made. Mm-hmm. Uh, they sold out very quickly. Oh, and uh I'm, hoping, I'm trying to get some more, but um, at the moment, it's just hard getting stuff into the country. Yeah, sure. So we're trying to get another run done, and I just wanted to make a couple of little tweaks to it. But that guitar, and it's also priced, you know, I, I just basically got it for, you know, selling it for what it cost me because I just like the idea of um, helping people out with guitars. And yeah, I just thought, great. well, these, these guitars are better quality than what some things are for double the price. Mm-hmm. And they just, yeah, they sound great. I use one, and you wouldn't be able to, you know, I can, I can use like a, very expensive Stratocaster or something, or use that. Most people aren't going to be able to pick a difference, right? <laughs> you know, that's very cool. I love how it's got the uh, it's got the is it like a three way switch for the three pickups, just one each, or are you using a five way? Uh, what we did with the ones that we were uh, on the prototype, there's only one switch. Yeah. Uh, on the um, ones we were selling, we put a uh, like a three three five very tone oh, okay. in the top. On the top bout part, you know. Oh, on, that's on the that chicken side. pointer knob. Yeah, 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 yeah. It looks like a Vox out knob. It looks or cool too. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's that's what that's like a very tone. So I, I get sort of get one sound. I'm happy with. It, I stick to it, and that's yeah. it. I just play, move my hands around to get to vary the sound. But sure. I realise that most people want all the different sounds. So we put that in there, and they give you like six different. You can get all the different combinations of all the sounds. It's very much like the Gibson very tone on the 
yeah, three nice. five five, or, yeah, and um, the other switch is a five way, oh, so you okay, can get the, yep. <clears throat> the strap thing going. Yeah, cool. You know, so it means that sort of the the, the uh, very tone knob, you can just put that in your bypass position, or you can use it. You have got a choice. Okay. Um, and then it's got the green pick guard and the block inlays, and it's got um, binding on the neck. Yeah, it looks awesome. It looks so. Cool. Yeah, it's great guitar, and it's so so. Yeah, it's a. a, a, a <laughs> A few of my friends straight away just just grabbed them, and it's like, oh, okay, these these are right, are they? Like, oh, these are great, <laughs> you know. So, um, I'm trying to get some more. So, <laughs> see how see how that goes. And I've got another I've got another design on the go as well. So, okay. We'll also if, with Alan, if, if they, with Alan, yeah, Al, yeah, Alan, yeah, yeah, cool. But Alan's, um, I think he's in his second or third lot of uh, quarantine at the moment because he oh, okay. he goes to he was going to between was in Wales. I think he was trying to get back to Wales in, right. in the UK, but he was um went to Spain. So he went to Spain. He's yep. got you know, family and stuff there. And okay. he wanted to get back to England. So it's a couple of different lots of quarantine each yeah, time, 14 yeah. days, you know. Yeah, they're doing it tough over there. Yeah. So um, it, so it's hard for him to be productive. Sure, sure. So hopefully by the end of the year. Okay. Oh, that's that's really cool. Can you divulge any details about the, the second idea you've got? Uh, the second idea? Well, yeah, basically it's like a, how would you call it? A, a bit like a telly thin line. You know, mm-hmm. with the uh, uh, 960, 970 telecaster thin lines, with the F hole thing, a bit like that, but in a, more of a, you know, a, a Stratocaster, um, Jazzmaster sort of way. Okay, nice. And uh, it's going to have three P, I think we decided three P90s on there. Okay, yeah. Um, it works in that, it's basically a strap, uh, you know, a, a souped up strap, but without being too hot, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Sounds great. So that's what like cool idea. Yeah, I think I've done like a, a white cream color with black binding. Um, so they're going to, you know, stick out in the crowd. Yeah, nice. So we'll see. Yeah, that's that's um, that's what I'm hoping for. So let's see if we can get stuff, stuff, um, stuff through on that. But it's just a bit hard at the moment with all the yeah, restrictions. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Martin, it's been fascinating talking to you about all this stuff. How's What's Thanks, the, Matt. Mate, absolutely. You've been so great. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up to date with all this stuff? So like the, the North Melbourne Surf Club and the new guitars coming in and, and just what you're doing in general. Uh, my website, martincilia.com. Yes. M-A-R-T-I-N-C-I-L-I-A.com. Most stuff will be linked from there. Great. And um, whenever, I've, whenever I interview someone who's got a website that's up to date, I like to mention that as a shout out because not everyone's is, but yours uh, is beautifully looked after and uh, very current. So that's oh, great. Good, good. I've trying, trying, just been trying to do some work on that recently to keep up with things. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. yeah, and there's actually a North Melbourne uh, Surf Club. There's a band website for that. I think i probably live by now. Oh, okay. Um, great. That's probably, uh, probably up by now as well. So uh, All right. I'll, yeah, I'll... try and keep keep current on that yeah excellent well i'll put the links in the show notes uh, for your site and also the north melbourne i'll have a dig around for that and that'd be great but uh martin thank you so much you've been super generous with your time and all these amazing stories (laughs) all right matt nice chatting thanks martin really appreciate it and um yeah i'll stay in touch cheers okay thanks mate see ya all right there you go my conversation with martin chilia i so enjoyed that such a gentleman and a legend of the guitar community in Australia. Uh, he's put together a fantastic career and a fantastic collection of instruments and he puts them to super good use. I, I, I know I said this in, in the interview, but I love it that he, he collects and loves this stuff, but he gigs with it and plays it and gets, uh, gets these instruments working rather than locking up them up behind glass cases or something. I think that's really, really cool. So... Awesome. Now there is there's going to be a part two to this interview. We continue talking about amps and pedals, and you will not be surprised that Martin's collection of that stuff is amazing as well in terms of historic significance and the uh, the gigable utility of it. Very cool. So I think that'll be a bonus episode coming up soon. My thanks to Martin for his time. My thanks to Joe Matira for getting me in touch with Martin. And uh, also my thanks to my sponsors, Fretboard Biology. There are links in the show notes to, uh, to that course, so please check it out. All right, my name is Matt Wakeling. You've been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. 
for the first show of 2021. I love putting these episodes together and I love it that people all around the world are enjoying them. That's such a, such a joy. Anyway, time to go. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Bye now.